I rise again with your leave, and on this occasion it is, as you have directed, to wrap up the debate and the uh, appropriation 2019 Bill 2018, and of course thereby in keeping with the standing orders to respond to issues raised in the financial statement, more properly referred to as a budget address. I want, in wrapping up the debate, to thank all who have contributed to the five days of discussion that we have had and an important piece of legislation. The budget fundamentally in our Westminster system of democracy is considered one of the most important pieces of legislation in that the failure of the parliament to give approval to the budget requires a government to fall. And so it is as significant as the motion of no confidence mm -hmm. in that regard. Yes. And so I am very much encouraged by the very positive support that this budget has had in the country yes. of St. Kitts and Nevis, and indeed on the government side of the House. So let me thank all of my colleagues in advance for their excellent support to this significant parliamentary debate. I must thank the Senior Minister, the Honourable Van Samri, who is, in a manner of speaking, sitting in for me at the passing out of the 42nd course of the police. I want to thank the Honourable Attorney General the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister of Public Infrastructure, of course the Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs who did a very nice um, presentation, the Honourable Minister of Agriculture, the Honourable Minister of Tourism et al, our Senator in the Ministry of Health and our Deputy Speaker. We have all spoken to the country about this magnificent budget that has been presented. And I want to thank those opposite for the contribution that they have made. Although I would have wished for the country's sake that they had come to debate better prepared and showing a better sense of understanding of where we are at in our history and in our development. Many of the things that they said had really no relevance to the debate. It may be things that they would want to say if there was a motion of no confidence being debated. But the budget by and large deal with matters of economics and finance and the outline and the projections and the way in which members opposite saw to go around as if they were going in America round and all kind of issues was really disheartening to many. Nonetheless, the country moves on with or without the members of the opposition. It is a hard reality for many of them to come to appreciate yes. that on the team unity the country is going forward ever, and we will not go back from whence we have come. It is a pleasant feeling today, as we wish it would be everywhere. The atmosphere out there now in 2018 is an atmosphere of peace and freedom. We can walk the streets of St. Kitts and Nevis. There is no tension, no apprehension, and this is a stark contrast to those who vividly record yeah. and recall where we were in 2012 as the motion of no confidence hung over the head of the parliament, yes. 2013 and 2014, when uncertainty pervaded the islands of St. Kitts 
a nevis. 2012 is significant in history, for it is the first time that a leader, a minister of finance and prime minister in our country and any other country, right. recognizing that he had failed the tests of popular support, had determined that he will abandon all traditions with respect to the debate. That's right. A budget debate should have occurred in December of 2012. The 11th. On the 11th, notice had been issued. And suddenly, in the late hours of the night, the Minister of Finance came like a cry baby to say, well, it looked like I'm not going to be able to present because I am not sure that my budget will have support. That's right. It was the first indication that the leader has lost his grip upon power. 2012, fast forward to 2018. We have come well in advance of the constitutionally prescribed limit requirement for the laying of the estimates and for this debate. The law says that we should come within the first 60 days of the new year. Which means, which means that for the 2019 budget in which we are engaged, we could have brought the estimates by the 1st March 2019 and have the debate 120 days thereafter. So what's the point? Draft estimates. In 2012, a budget could not have taken place. And in 2013, Mr. Speaker, they went beyond the constitutional requirement to bring the debate because of the heavy uncertainty in the country. Because by that time, the motion of no confidence had begun to energize the people and the country. And there was fear in the leadership then about what would happen. They brought some special resolution to allow them to get over the constitutional hurdle. But there is no special resolution that can undo the damage and the violation of the constitution. That is a fundamental point. 2012 marked a dark day in the history of democracy in St. Kitts and Nevis, when a government faced with the reality of representative democracy was found wanting. Where in this scale could not come to face the people? And the motion of no confidence was essentially to test that. We have come in 2015 ahead of time. We came in 2016 ahead of time with our budget. And we have now, and 2017, we have come well in advance. So we can give stability and positive direction to all players in the country. Businesses know, for example, no new taxes. They could plan on that. Those are the people who are out there, the government auxiliary workers, know what will come in 2019. People can settle and organize their lives. The budget clearly outlines how we will move forward. A year of sustaining growth and prosperity. A year of job creation in public infrastructure in housing, in the human settlements, generally in manufacturing, in agriculture, is envisaged. A year of continued improvement in the people's welfare. More homes to come by NHC to the Development Bank, the roof repair program, better roads are to come. Yesterday, the member for number one spoke about some 69 million dollars to be pumped again to the constituencies right. already started in number four already started in number five already started number in number eight 
always started everywhere, and I'm hoping soon to come to number seven. <laughs> so the entire country, number three too. Number six. and number three, and number six, and number five, and all, all over, over would benefit. That has come because we have planned carefully. We know what to look forward to in 2019 when our RL Bratcher Airport will get its new runways and taxiways. We know what to look for. We know to look forward to the second coup spare in our country. We know what to look for. And because these are investment in the productive assets of the country, we know that they will catalyze growth. That's right. The member for number two came, not to show where she came from. As hurriedly as she came, she exited, so she will not learn. Any investment in the productive infrastructure of the country would help the country and its forward journey. That is what we are about. Roads, people can get to and fro much more quickly, yes. increase productivity, more convenience, people feel more comfortable after their journey, are able to produce more, adding to a better quality of life for all in St. and Nevis. 2019 signals the solution to the problem at Old Road Bay. That's right, yeah. Every time a hurricane, the road is dissected, washed away. You can't pass through Old Road to go to Sandy Point, and from Sandy Point to Old Road. Yes. Rock comes a tumbling down. Water beating the road, undermining it, right. and all of us fear for our safety. In our 2019 budget, we have provided for that. And the first phase in terms of the road stabilization, the Minister for Number One said has already started. So we are moving forward. Moving forward with confidence. Indeed, the only elements in the country who are pessimistic are those on the opposite side. That's right. The good news in the country becomes bad news for them That's right. because they see their chances of ever coming over here being diminished. Yeah. So they want bad news right. in the country, but it will not happen. 2018, we as it were have crossed the Rubicon into something good and beautiful. That is why we had the Marquee Port designation by the Florida Caribbean Cruise Association, the only country in the Caribbean to have had that designation accorded in 2018. The Minister of Tourism and all the workers deserve some commendation for that. It is not Antigua. It is not Dominica. It is not St. Lucia. It is the smallest country in the Caribbean and in the hemisphere that is shining and that is getting these accolades. It is the smallest country that has been able to manage its fiscal affairs so well that we can pay back-to-back -back salary for the third time in a row. And they could never compete with this in the history. Indeed, indeed, members of the opposition and poll were among the first in the queue to check out and their double salary. And they don't deserve it by their performance. But they were the first in the queue to go to look for their double salary. And the Deputy Prime Minister says, that the leader of the opposition says that he didn't get any. Oh, no. We must ask why. That. Did he answer? No. He wouldn't answer. <laughs> because the leader of the opposition is ashamed to say 
that when he exited or was forced by the people out of the office of the government, he had over $200,000 of the government money for which he had not accounted for subsistence advanced to him. Over $200,000. And following the rules of the government, these have to be withdrawn against your salary. That is what the rules provide for. And so we have started that program. So we did ducking out. And he still, he still owes a lot of money, you know. He still owes a lot of money. Dr. Douglas still owes this government, in fact, if we wanted to be bad, we should really pay him nothing at all because he has withheld from the government $183,894.50 still after we started this program of taking out little bit, little bit, month after month from him. $199,894.50. All when they were government ministers, they go up to the treasury, give us this junker money. They come back home, they're not gone to explain it. They're not submitting any bills. That is what has happened. The senator opposite, he owed the government $13,392. And he has so far paid back $13,344. $48.02 would have been deducted from his double. That is why all of them, and this thing is happening for years, they don't dare to say a thing. What's the point for it? The, the, the member who has just spoken has made a misrepresentation. No misrepresentation. The member has indicated no that I owe the government money. I never owe the government any money. You just didn't pay? No, 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 no. no. Oh. The Ministry of Finance, Treasury Department, was directed by you to determine that I owe the government money. Okay. And I could have taken the matter to court, but just simply move on. I owe the government no money Honourable at all. Honourable Senator um, opposite, uh, uh, the Minister of Finance has made a specific statement that a member of this house, in this case you, is owing particular sums to the government. It's the Minister of Finance. Um, I have to take his word for it as the Minister of Finance. You would have to, in your defense, provide some evidence that you're not owing. Continue, Honorable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Continue. The member for number two owed the government $11,603. We wrote to them, invite them to come and pay. They refused to come. We started the ducking. But she is a lawyer. They know what the rules. The subsistence form clearly states that you are obliged and return to clear the advance warrant. Patrice Nismith, $5,819.61. Another lawyer. Not breaking the law. And you know, up to now they ain't said nothing. Cut another wrong. They embarrassed by this reality. And that is what happened. And then they come here to make a point about ethics. Ethics when they have been dishonest in terms of the obligation, when they have failed to meet their commitments which they signed for each time they took an advance for the government to settle promptly. That is what has happened, Mr. Speaker. They haven't. So when we hear them come with this new refrain that the oldest party last... I remember for Honourable Prime Minister move of the bill. As indicated earlier, I would not be tolerating much cross-talk during the wrap-up. Any interruptions must be on a point of order. And the point of order 
the member is going to have to indicate to me what is the breach, what is the presenter, which rule is he breaching. I allowed that a while ago because it, it's a specific statement made. You've gotten up and you've refuted that. That ends that matter. Not much more, much more I can do on that. So we move on. Thanks. Mr. So Speaker, this is the point. They have come here with their pretense. They suddenly become a Christian. <laughs> Nobody see them go to the altar to be saved. But suddenly, they were the biggest sinners out there. They come now to say, give them a second chance. Second chance to do what? When the country gave you four chances between 95 and 2014. 95, 2000, 2004, 2010. That's right. Four chances, and you want more. You come back now, in your old age, as it were, to tell us you've gone to the church to be christened. What do you think the membership would say? Because this is the reality. When the member for number six says that at his age now, chronologically, at his age, after having been in parliament from 89, he comes to the country to say, I now have come with the code of conduct. That is akin to the old man at 76 going up to say he get in prison. Everybody can ask why at that age. Why he didn't just do the baptism? He got to do no prison at 76. You don't pass that. It's time had long passed for the member for number six. If he was serious about good governance, to have had a code of ethics? How does he want us to take him seriously yes. when he had an integrity in public life legislation and he failed to act upon it? The integrity in public life imposes a statutory code of discipline and conduct that should govern public officials. He didn't want that. He want now to come to volunteer something, not have it crystallize in law. These persons are not serious about ethics and ethical conduct. And they come to the parliament today with nothing to say on the budget but to offer distraction. We hear they come and they say to us, the Hurricane Relief Fund is illegal. Yeah. Well, they have a lot of lawyers over there. The member for number two, of course, wouldn't be one to line up. She's not a bright lawyer, but they could find others. If it is legal, test it in the court. When we said that the senator's bill was illegal, we had the courage to go to the court, and the court ruled in our favor. When we, at Steam Unity, determined that it was an infringement on our right as a members to have the motion of no confidence heard. We went to the clear arbiter, the court of justice, and the court again vindicated us. Said to the member of number six, you were so wrong. And he knew he was wrong to have denied us the right to hear the motion. Indeed. So convinced we were. It is three motions were filed by the member and minister of foreign affairs, by the deputy prime minister, and by myself. Three motions were filed in 2013. Not one was heard. You talk about ethics? Is ethics about moral leadership? and guidance, how dare the member for number six comes to the parliament to talk about he has laid a motion of no confidence. When for 27 months he denied others the right to even have it listed on the other paper, tabled, debated, and most importantly, voted upon. And they come to talk to us about ethics. They want to talk to us about ethics. 
with regard to the program. And a member in their leadership, he is benefiting from the same program. The Minister of Foreign Affairs was so right. How can he be silent, allow the last leader to mislead the country with regarding the legality of the Hurricane Relief Fund when he is benefiting? His wife is benefiting. His family is benefiting. They say it is an illegal act. It is a crime to participate and to benefit from illegal proceeds. He should know that, and his wife should have advised him that. And he should have been sufficiently courageous to stand and say, Mr. Leader, I cannot support you in your criticism of our Hurricane Relief Fund. Good or bad, it is ours. Good or bad, we are benefiting from it. Good or bad, let us give the country the opportunity to rise again from the blows of the hurricane. No, no, no. No, no, no. They wouldn't do that. But yet they come today with a word they have learned. Our words. Ethics. Ethics. A new word that has come about for them. Ethics. And when they had the opportunity to demonstrate it, not just by words, but by deeds, they fell sharp, weighed in the scale. And so they come back again to remind us that is what they have done. Capis and Bass is one of the more successful participants in, in the Citizenship by Investment program. And we are so bad and are not going to infer any negative on the company. But we want to make the point. They say we are so bad, but we have never sought to disinherit them and to stop their performance in the program. Every encouragement we could have given, we have given to them. Ask Ashley Alice in contrast how he was treated, how he was even under the last administration. This government is nice. This government may be too nice, Mr. Speaker. And so we ask that they contain themselves and their excesses, excesses in relation to the country. How could they talk about ethics when sitting among them is a man who is charged in front of the court, the member for number six and the 10th and the 11th of January 2019, will answer whether he's qualified to be in this honorable parliament. And I'm not going to the details of that because that will be well argued. But when even membership is being questioned in the parliament, how could that person be the leading voice in the House of Parliament, when his legitimacy is under question, the question of whether or not Obama was qualified to be President of America was like a shadow over his head for the entire two terms of his presidency. Even after he had exited office as the most popular president, he reported that he was damaged by that rumor regarding the legitimacy of his position to hold that high office in the land. So Obama was concerned, did everything to clear it up. In contrast, the man who wants to come back again doesn't want to clear up whether or not he is qualified to be in the House. And how could they talk about ethics? when he holds a diplomatic passport not contested now for another country? How could it be ethical that while he is here criticizing our program, he's in Dubai advertising and promoting Dominica's program? How could that be ethical? The very man who wants to come back again to get revenge upon people is criticizing the program 
of his born in land because he has been tied to the Dominica citizenship program. In fact, he has an investment in a property of over 324 rooms in Dominica. Every time he leaves here, he goes to Dubai to promote Dominica's program. And further, when he went in the, the office at 4 a.m., he took out all the files of the citizenship program, and he has been trading on that information to the disadvantage of St. Kitts and Nevis. Unethical is a member for number six. How could he come again to the country? He went to Antigua. While he was in Antigua, a minister called me, said he's up there trying to persuade the government of Antigua to buy the information from him. And I said, I don't expect that Gaston will do that. Could you say something? Because what he does to St. Kitts, he will do to Antigua. And just as we said, yes. Gaston had a heart. Just like when he called Gaston, Gaston told me, the Honorable Prime Minister, to tell him a couple of days ago not to send anybody to support the RSS initiative in St. Kitts and Nevis. The Honorable Member for Number One was there. Prime Minister, but Tim, I don't understand Douglas. He's a strange guy. Oh, you remembered? You have a good memory. So that's a strange guy. Because he should know that as a sitting Prime Minister, I listen to governments, I don't listen to opposition. I said, what he told you when you tell him? He said, I look like he works for me, but I don't care. As a Prime Minister, he listened to governments. And somebody must have told all the member for number six, something don't look right. That you are saying that crime is a problem in the country. The government is getting help to enhance the peace and security of the nation. To help protect our law enforcement officers, complement the adult of manpower. And they want to stop it. It's the same he did this year. Prime Minister Gonzal told me he wrote him a bad letter. He couldn't understand how any Prime Minister who having said what he has said would basically write to him and ask him to deny his country the opportunity of the RSS support. And that man comes back and made what you said a plaintive case. <laughs> Plaintively, to come back again. Come back again after what you have done, havoc in the country, after you have shown such blatant display of unpatriotic act. That is what he has come back to ask. It's this late hour of the game. Something is definitely wrong with that leadership. And yes, Mr. Speaker, you listen to them. They talk about ethics. And they have been at the, their unethical best. Yes. While in government, raking the treasury, and nobody at the time was concerned about ethics. Imagine the member for number two whose mother has repeatedly expressed disappointment in her performance. She had exclusive authority over the Development Bank. She received over four million dollars, never deny that, from the bank, held the bank captive, came into a cabinet to sign her mortgage document, not paying attention to what was happening in the government. And she comes to say that a couple of weeks ago, she went to sign a code of ethics. Would the code of ethics tell you now to bring back the four million dollars that you got a monopoly for? Would the code of ethics guide you that way? They are not serious about politics and ethics and that the two must cohabit. They are not interested in that. They are not interested in the good news. 
The foreign minister says that when they heard the news about Four Seasons closing, they said, that's good. Because they want pain on people. They're not concerned about the country. There's a passage somewhere in Deuteronomy which admonishes us to be careful of the country to which we would return. You may have a Dominican passport and you think you could go to Dominica. Well, what happens? Would you want to come back to St. Kitts and Nevis? Then be careful of the country to which you may have to return. I am concerned that the opposition is not concerned that by their nasty politics, they are attempting to destroy the very same kids that they want to lead. <coughs> this question of ethics is a serious one. It begs for reason for the member for number six to explain how he, as a sitting prime minister, was denied a US visa while as a sitting prime minister. When the former ambassador came to the country in 2015, he begged like a baby that they reconsider his application and allow him to go to an energy conference they were having in Washington, D.C. with Vice President Biden. The gentleman says, no, not for what we have on you, not for what is on the record, and up to this day, the man who is now signing a code of ethics has not explained to the country why he was denied a visit to visit the United States of America while being a sitting prime minister. Never happened anywhere in the world. Putin, despite all the controversy, visited America. Castro, despite all the uncertainty, visited America. Maduro, who they considered to be an enemy, visited America. But the member for number six, then Prime Minister Dr. Denzel Llewellyn Douglas, could not visit America. And up to this day, he cannot visit America. He was in the line in Bar Barbados with one Johnny. And when Johnny came out with his, Johnny told me Douglas came out after me. Boy, and his face was down. He took the passport as he see Johnny looking at him into his arm um, jacket pocket. And he tells us he wasn't standing in the line, you were walking out. He wasn't standing in the line, you were walking out with nothing. Two weeks ago, tragedy hit. And I extend sympathies to his family close family, husband of his sister pass. Ah. Understand? You have said it. Could not go to extend sympathy because what is on the record is so bad that the U.S. government considers him unfit to enter the U.S. territory. And that is about Ethical conduct. Hmm? Hmm? I know. And they refuse. Something is very much wrong. And I challenge him to explain to the country. It's not about whether you were standing in the line. It was not about whether Johnny was ahead of you or behind you. It is whether or not you, the member for number six, who wants to lead our country, do you have in your possession a valid visit to enter America? And why was it denied you? That is a question. <laughs> and even that they say no. So that has to be something very, very bad. Very, very bad. And it goes to the question of ethics, which he brought in the debate. And I am saying that over there, over there cannot be the moral compass of the country. Over there, none would lead by example. How could a leader so tainted, so rejected at home and abroad want to force himself again? And the people of St. Kitts and Nevis without explanation. 
I told you Putin can go to America. Yes. Maduro for all the war mongering you hear between those two islands. Senkits. Senkits is a friend and ally of America. But Senkits can't put up no war. You can't even think about it. You'll be a fool. And America is saying, and said to its former leader, we don't want you inside of America. The citizens of the country must ask him to explain why he has become a pariah, cannot travel to the USA, and want to come back to lead us. That is how you hope to get there again, to us, riding on the backs of the people who would have put you there, and then you say, well, I am clean now, like the old 76 year old man who gone to christen rather than go to the sea, get some duck baptized. Father with the christening after that. In our tradition, you go when you're young, you take the baby to christen. <laughs> One month, two months, three months, up to a year after that, you got church people. Say, so, man, you're all full of joke. I come this time and talk about christening. That is what is happening. And he must explain what is happening to the people. So he wouldn't beg pardon no. because he has no ethics. It is ethics that allows you to humble yourself, to recognize your failing, and to say, I've accepted I have wronged the country, but please forgive me. I want to move forward. There is no redemption. I want to say to the country that this country is a country that continues to make us proud. This is a country whose citizens can reach to unimaginable heights and have reached in the USA, in Canada, on the athletic field, everywhere our people have done well. And it must be of concern to people when the opposition comes. And their word to the citizen is always to keep them at the lowest standard of behavior and conduct. So it is okay if you're a law enforcement officer to carry a firearm for 10 months, not one day, not 10 days, 10 months without having it licensed. And instead, they say to the officer, I'm ashamed and surprised that you, a law enforcement officer, would allow that to happen and implicate me in it by association. That's a well, it's victimization. Yeah. Victimization. Yeah. When you knowingly and for a prolonged period of time broke the law, which was a law enforcement officer, you swear to uphold. How could that be right? How can we build a better sink it's a nevis when leaders condone wrong? When they want to make wrong right, can't happen. How could you set the standard for ethical conduct in an improved St. Kitts and Nevis? When you say to a customs officer, it is all right to carry an unlicensed firearm. It is all right. And for days, in all that is happening here about crime, not to report it, and when the gun disappears, disappears for days from the custom officer, and he refuses to go to the police, when, when he goes, and they already put aside the ammunition from the gun. You understand? All that is happening. And he's up and down panicking, calling people, do you see my gun? And refusing to go to the police. How could any serious party condone that kind of behavior and want to lead our country? We don't know how the gun was used for those periods for which it was out of his possession. And the officer will not cooperate. Because the member for number six buys it. Oh, don't bother with them. It's all politics. Ethical conduct and behavior you can't be wrong and still be right. Can't be wrong and strong. And so we are not convinced 
that they are ready for leading the country again and to provide the kind of ethical leadership the country requires. I am so proud of some of the excellent news that we've been having, not only as it relates to the back-to-back -back salaries, the repayment to the government, auxiliary workers, the arrival of the Symphony of the Seas, the opening of the East Bus Terminal, the Cary Brewery, just last Friday made history, never before. One million cases of brewery products achieved. Well. The Senator and Deputy Speaker was there to herald in and to celebrate with its 140 or thereabout employees. The Minister of Trade was there with the leadership of the brewery plant. Yeah. Celebrate and acknowledging that something good is happening in the country. Why do they come and speak to the value of productivity? To build our people and to give them hope. You know, they come to talk about you must let people do as they like. Pulling down, lowering the standards of discipline in the country. And then one of them, not a serious contender, of course, he says, well, why the government is taking the civil servants to court? Justice delayed is justice denied. It's not we taking them to court, they're taking us. And they have a right to. And we will defend ourselves as a government in the court because that is how the system works. That is the law. It was the law passed by them in 2011 that outlined what were the limitations and the involvement of civil servants. And let us make it very clear. We welcome all. Our record is that we have been a most generous government. We have not looked at politics. We came in and we worked with those who were willing to work. The chief personnel officer is still there. The financial secretary is still there. The deputy financial secretaries are still there. If you are a civil servant, you know that you have to work with whoever the administration is. And you conduct yourself in appropriate ways. If we want to live the standards we have to set to people. You can do what you like on election day, but you have to give loyal and professional service to the government once you are working there. Duty of loyalty. Duty of loyalty to every employer. You couldn't be working at Oxford's, and when people come, you're telling them, go to TDC to buy their car, to buy their truck. Why do you think you could work for the government? and publicly undermine the government. That makes sense. Why would we not allow it in the private sector, but think it could be sustained in the government sector? Huh? And they made the law, but they want to go against it. That don't make sense. They are not ready for prime time. Not ready for prime time and they come to ask for another chance. And instead of looking at the big picture, to look at where the country must go, they find petty issues to hold on. I heard one of them said, well, how come Queely gonna leave? You think we're afraid to answer? We said it publicly, nothing to afraid, that we have determined that where public officers had accumulated excessive vacation leave, they must begin to draw down on it. Like, Not only did we say it, like but, but the civil service rules like put in place by the Douglas Labour Party says that no civil servant must be allowed to have more than 54 days accumulated unless that is 
formally approved. None of them, none of them have anything in writing granted. And we could, in accordance with the Douglas Law, so to speak, say to them, well, you lose all of these holidays because the lost a 54. We simply say, let us start a scheduling and work these out. You know, some of the persons they're talking about, they have almost nine years of holidays put up. Nine years! Nine years! How could any responsible opposition take exception to proper human rituals policies and want to develop the country? Nine years of holidays. What we are doing is to have the courage to do the right thing. And I don't take any pride to talk about any official of the government, but they name him. The speaker did not stop them, no fault of the speaker. But you know that same Creeley, they brought him from RSS in Barbados to the country to take over the police force. Promise by the member for number six. And when he came, the member for number six said to the cabinet, he's no longer sure about Creeley because Creeley had too many PAM friends. He told us that. He had too many PAM friends. When Queely went for the interview with us on about, Queely told me they called him at the last minute. He had to hustle to go to the site to do the interview. After the interview, which results were already predetermined, because the member for number six said he had too many PAM friends, he couldn't trust him. Queely knows that. Queely knows that, you know. And, and what happened? Astana did a report. The report said that Queely is not suited. Because if, even if you look at the way he dressed when he came to the interview, he was disqualified. He color crush up, Astana said. Those were the little things. Because they had already made up their mind and queerly, so they clutched at every straw. And maybe indeed the color was, was scusher. Because he told me he got a last minute call. Joking, that is what it was. Joking. They brought a man all the way, Texas, petition. over Commissioner Queerly. The amount of money they were paying for his house. <laughs> was greater than Queely's pay. But who was benefiting from that payment of allowance for Sidney Walwin? The senator opposite had a house up at Bordeaux, Mr. Months. Speaker, and rent sat in a cabinet months. that determined for the first time in history rent the Commissioner of Police will get an housing allowance. Williams didn't get any before him. No other commissioner got a housing allowance to fix up, to fix up the senator. They brought in a housing allowance that was higher than the current salary assigned to the office of the commissioner of police. Ethical conduct, they raise it. Huh? I don't know if you sign the code, may sign it upside down. <laughs> because, you see, we had the, the, the I mean, the effrontery. Because when the matter of the passport was raised, this country laughed, bemused, amused, and bemused. Which come first? I don't know. I had the amused. You had both. I had both of them too. I got amused because of them. Amuse and then be muse. And then you shake your head and you say, the member for number six can't be real. He told the member for number one that I didn't apply for the Dominican passport. I signed the form. And <laughs> I said, you understand that? When you sign the form, you're officially applying for your visa, for your passport. You know, he said, the form given to me, and it was blank. So I signed a blank form, knowing what it was for. An application for. An application for. That is what we are talking about, ethics. A new commissioner comes in 
and the principal beneficiary is a member of the cabinet. Not only did he benefit from the rental, Sidra put all kind of gadgets That's right. upon the house at the expense of the country. And they knew something was not right about it, Mr. Speaker, that in the payment, they asked that the payment be made to Cloda Mitchum for his house in Bordra. That reminds me of Adam in the garden hiding, hiding from the Lord. Adam in the garden. The allegation that the chief of police who rented my apartment. Oh, you're coming out now. Allow me to speak, please. Coming I've never denied now. that. Who rented my apartment, yes. purchased gadgets for the property from which I benefited. Yes, you benefited. There is no gadget. Oh. At that house that was purchased by C.J. Walwyn, that is there subsequent to his movement out of the house. And the property has always been managed by my sister up until today. Ah. Up until today. No ah. hiding. Oh, well, you have to continue it. Arm length management must be that my sister must be in charge of my property. Come on. Out of order. Come on. Out of order. I would, I would exercise some. Control. I, I, I would. I would allow points of order, but I would. Honourable members, please. May I? So your point of order was with reference to a statement made about gadgets left. You have, you rose and you indicated that no gadgets were left. Thank you. All right. Move on. So they took back his gadget. What a man! He must. He was overweight. Going back out. With all the luggage. You understand? So that is where it is, you know. The question of ethics, they raise it. They can't deal with it. Not at all. We raise the matter of health care, which was a song and dance. Who was the worst minister of health in history? The member for number two. We have been doing things, Mr. Speaker to expand the range of healthcare services to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis, MRI services, yes, oncology services, mm -hmm. mental treatment services, all of these, because we recognize we have to bring more services to the people yes. and ground. Not every member would be so fortunate that when they're sick, they will find a godfather in government that will send them off to the Baptist International Health in Miami like Senator Carty was. Not every citizen will be so afforded the opportunity to be fly, flown out of the country talking all kind of language. You understand? And taken and taken to Baptist at the expense of the country, $135,000 to subsidize the health of the member, Senator Opposite. We are attempting to improve health care. The member for number six, when he fell ill, no citizen in his constituency would be fortunate to find that they could get a medical bill of $508,000 being paid for. Yes, $508,000 it costs for the treatment of member for number six Absolutely. and for all 20 years Absolutely. to ensure that the rest of the country benefits. They couldn't bring universal health care to the country because they are favorites. 135,000 for Senator to go to Miami. 508,000 plus for the member for number six. He went off to New York. The rest of the country would get nothing. They can't stand the test of scrutiny. A pathetic display we had for members opposite. They talk 
not only about ethics, to talk about relations with Nevis and Nevis transfer. And sometimes you wonder why the opposition just don't hush, hush. For every time the opposition opens its mouth, something is there in its past and history that shames them. It was that opposition that bounced the trek for the Nevis Island administration. How dare now to come to talk about transparency and transfers to the NIA? How dare they could talk about that? Trek bounds like never before under their watch. Not once in any of their 20 years could they point to once where they helped the Nevis Island administration with a subvention. Please. And they come now Please. to talk about transfers to the Nevis Island administration. It can't work. It was a member for number six in one of our debate came and went on so abominable about this money. Ah, oh, you take up our money, he said. Send up your money up on Nevis to buy the support up there. Think it's money not supposed to go on Nevis. You wouldn't believe that that was a former leader of a twin island state talking about that, about the people of Nevis. So, Mr. Speaker, the country moves on and continues to move on. It was under the watch of the leader opposite that for the first time in history in a parliamentary democracy, a sitting prime minister was described by a sitting judge as a stranger to the truth. In any other democracy, the leader and prime minister would have resigned forthwith. When the second independent arm of the state, the judiciary says in open court that you are a stranger to the truth. And the justice, was it Justice Thomas? Who it was? Bell has been proven right and right ever so often that the member for number six is indeed a stranger to the truth. But it went worse. It went worse. And when you begin to construe the importance of the judiciary as a check on democracy, on a check on democracy, you understand how they undermine the democracy, but they went further. I understand what you're doing now. The Attorney General, Dennis Merchant, became the first Attorney General to be charged with contempt of court. Contempt of court. That matter was settled. The matter was settled. Contempt of court. For his conduct. First time in history. Yes. Honourable member for number, honourable senator opposite, um, beginning to find that your interventions, interruptions, are so becoming guys, more, yeah. more persistent. So guys, yeah. you please you refrain. Know. Continue, honourable member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Can't deal with the truth, and that is what ethics requires of you to honour. The truth. Mr. Speaker, they want to talk about democracy in St. Kitts and Nevis. Let's have the debate. Because some of the most discolorful and reprehensible acts on democracy took place under the leadership for the member for number six. Things that we thought would never happen, happened in St. Kitts and Nevis under its leadership. Things that we thought would never happen, thank you very much, happen. The enslaved at the Constitution, I remember one legal luminary in discussions with us, said to us, your Constitution never contemplated a Douglas. So the legal luminary said, 
He said, the constitution of Senkitz and Nevis never contemplated a Denzel Douglas because the extent to which he took the country over the brink in his behavior and conduct, the constitution never had contemplated such egregious conduct by a leader. Hong said it too. The Hunks is a wise man from Connery. But they said, the Constitution never contemplated a Denzel Douglas coming, or else it would have done some reforms long before he came. The Constitution never anticipated that you could have a leader and a national leader, whatever the faults, go on a political platform in Maynard's Park in Kayon and say, I am a master of incitement. I undermine law and order in this country. And if they want to test me, I will do it again. That is an onslaught on democracy. The Constitution never contemplated that. The Constitution could never have contemplated on our democracy that you will have a leader that would bring in Cambridge Analytica and Strategic Communications Limited, two of the most notorious political entities in the UK, to spy upon its citizens. Breach of democracy. They want us to have a discussion on those matters. The Constitution and our democracy would have never contemplated that in January of 2015, the leader within three minutes of the completion of the report by the Boundaries Committee would have convened an emergency sitting of the Parliament, an emergency sitting of the Parliament, telling us that that report had reached him in three minutes, left headquarters, raised up, to Sir Edmund Lawrence at Government House. Sir Edmund Lawrence went through over 3,000 pages in less than a minute and a half, signed a formal report, sent it back down, moved through all the traffic, for no traffic lights, all of that within three minutes. And it was ready for debate in the parliament. Our constitution and our democracy never anticipate a sinister being like Denzel Douglas leading. Within three minutes, all of those things happen. And within a few minutes of that thing, a proclamation was made. A proclamation was made. The democracy never contemplated it. What and you it? heard the English Just judge. Does the government general live over the wall? You the English man asked, does the governor general live over the wall? So he got a report so quickly from here to up there, going through all those busy street, K on street, college street. And he got it. And he read it, and he made a reply, and he sent it back to the member for number six. And he read what the governor had said, governor general, and it was ready for debate. That is an onslaught on the democracy of St. Kitts and Nevis. None could deny it. None could deny it. And the trust. Ah, that was the word. I heard you. To talk about the swan song, yes. the last dance, the last hooray before they die. Right. That was what you learned in school, you said. What do you call it? Um, the courage, Samuel Courage. Okay, write it down, we'll come back to that. <laughs> Constitution and democracy never contemplated that. Who would have contemplated in St. Kitts and Nevis? You would have had. You would have had nomination day, and you don't know where you're voting. I don't know if I'm in seven. Yes. I don't know if I'm in eight. I work in both places. <laughs> nomination day. 
You asked me to go to take a note that I would be the representative of this particular area. And uncertainty hangs across the nation. Boundaries in contest. And the very man who led that, he comes and he said that his motion <coughs> of no confidence will be about democracy. Democracy. If democracy was a human being, <laughs> he would have been charged with attempted murder. <laughs> if democracy was a human being, he must have been charged with attempted murder for all of these things. Democracy never contemplated. You would have the member for number six to deal with. And that is why when we have the discussions and it comes up and people ask about Privy Council and Sissy Dre, regrettably, people in the country say thank God to Privy Council. For had it not been for the Privy Council, what would have happened? But I believe it was more than the Privy Council. It was the will of God. The will of God showed us clearly what we had to do to set the people of St. Kitts and Nevis free. I recall one good friend of mine said, after what happened in the parliament, his mother, that had been labor all of her life and could never be anything else, said, this thing can't work. Can't work. It was a turning point for people of ethical values in the country That's right. to see where the democracy was headed. That's right. I met a citizen over in um, East, and in canvassing, the citizen said to me, where I came from originally. That was what was happening, you know. Mm -hmm. I came to St. Kitts, the citizen said, never engage in politics for me. It has always been a hobby. He likes debates. He likes to look at the BBC, what you call it, hard talk, yes, and all of those stuff. He said, when he saw what happened, in the parliament, what date it was? In January 2015, on the 16th of January, he recognized he had no choice but to vote out the member for number six and his administration. That must be one of the four that took you over, member for number one. You understand? One of the four that took him over. It was the Onslaught and democracy that led the people of St. Kitts and Nevis to recognize, notwithstanding all the big bands and the big crowds and the 4,000 people in red, even when they go in funeral, they make them put on red like a puppy show. Yeah, red casket, no, you know. Yes, red casket. Yeah, red casket. Understand? <laughs> to make a show that there was popular will. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Yes. Our country was rescued by the people and through divine intervention. And that is why I keep maintaining the 2015 election was a praying election. Right. I thank God for people like Nurse Garnet and all the other prayer warriors far and near who day after day said this man must let our people go. And that happened. And so those of us who are in the battle, we will not go back from whence we came. We will not, Mr. Mr. Speaker. We will not. So Mr. Speaker, we continue to do what we can to take the country forward. We continue to shun the practices of the past, talking about that. We could talk about the stint of Dr. Christmas as an ambassador to the United Nations. The whole world knew that the former ambassador was to serve the country at no cost to the state. Suddenly, 
in 2005, he got a call which said to him, you are not taking your salary, that ain't no help to me or to the Labour Party. He said, well, I don't need. I've retired. I have pension out of Africa and all the place we have served as a water engineer. What it is you are requesting of me? The ambassador told me that the member for number six asked him to take his salary from the government and pass it to the Labour Party as a contribution because that made more sense to him. The records of the government shows, and I asked the accountant general, that just as the man has said, that was the period in which salaries start to be paid to him. Salaries which years before were never paid because he said he would serve the country freely suddenly had to be paid and then decide the code of ethics. And when he came to me at that time, I was serving as chairman of the party. He came to me and he asked me for the account number of the party I gave him. What I knew was the account number of the St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party at National Bank. And he came, because he and I was good. And he said to me, but the, I said, he come and, you know, he, he walk deliberately and he come and he said, but the number you give me, not the same as what the member for number six gave me. I said, how do you mean? I took up the phone, I called the secretary of the party, confirmed that that is the number known to us. When he showed me, I then called over the bank. How this number come about? Make member for number six created an account in the name of the Labour Party Committee to which Dr. Christmas was directed to transfer his salary. Who are the signatories to the account? The member for number six, Dr. Denzel Douglas, Mr. Joseph Edney, the cabinet secretary, and Beverly Knight, his personal assistant. Three signatories with no standing in the party. That became a slush fund, a special fund of support. And they come to talk about integrity. Require that the state lose the savings of the salary to create the slush fund. And Beverly Knight never been a member of the executive of the party. It need never been. Well, in one way you could say it, because Douglas came to the party and he said, well, the party leader must have the authority to co up members. And that was to deal with any dissenting voice. So they ain't go to no convention because nobody will elect Joseph Edmead, my good teacher of economics. Nobody would. So those people then had blinded loyalty to the leader. So he co-opted them and the executive. And they then ran things and the executive. They want to talk about a lot of things. And we could go on to talk about some of those things. He must explain how is it that his personal assistant went to a bank on Fourth Street with 95,000 US dollars and ran away from the bank. When the bank began to ask questions, she said that he was in a dilemma in Dubai and she needed to transfer $95,000 in small bills to him. ECI US. US. The bank considered it a suspicious transaction and she ran out the bank. Yeah, the evidence is there. And they are talking about wanting to come back. Ask him why he went from Dubai by a private jet Nigeria. to Nigeria. What was so urgent for him to take a private jet at the cost of US $185,000? What was so urgent to move from Dubai by private charter to Nigeria? I want to know. The country needs to know. 
I have the name of the carrier, but I want him to like the passport matter. I signed the application, I never applied. I just signed. That is what we are dealing with. And that is why we are running away from moving forward. The same deceit that has always characterized the leadership of the member for number six. He came in and he didn't see what was on the ECCB report. Mm -hmm. The ECCB board get consult that a former member of the Monetary Council should come to the Parliament and told a blatant untruth. This man is not an easy man. You listen to him. He said the bank became so concerned that the government had given false information. The bank got scared, didn't want to get themselves in any fraud by the government. So the bank, as soon as the government began to talk about growth, went on the website and take it down. Here the governor of the bank. What we put on the website, we never removed. Never removed. For there was no reason to. That is the nature of the man who want to lead us again. Can't be honest. The megalomania, the power hungriness of the man. He will do and say anything for state power. He reminds me of Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. Time is up and he never understands that time had come. Yes, you did wonderful things, Robert Mugabe, like taking the land for Zimbabweans. Yes, but afterwards, you put the country in a mess and the country needed rescue. Robert Mugabe never understood until they went to him, literally, with a big gun to say, we will not have it anymore. You have to move out. It is full type. I either remember for number three, or we could forget the member for number two. She's just singing her lullaby. She doesn't really have serious time. Or the member for Nevis. Say to the leader and member for number six, you cannot be the face of the future, taking the party or taking the country forward. The member comes in to the parliament and he says, but why are they spending $1.5 million and government headquarters? This must be a slush fund. That's right. I mean, that man. That's a real former prime minister with this kind of ignorant view. $1.5 million in the budget to renovate government headquarters, to fix the elevator, to deal with all the dilapidation and squalor that he left the building in. The same squalor that led to the closure of the Bastyr High School because of the negligence and incompetence of the senator opposite while serving as a minister of education. That was the pattern of the way. It is the same squalor and dilapidation that they left the Coast Guard in. It was the same squalor and dilapidation that they left almost every other building ministry of education in. And then they have this song and dance. Oh, mole everywhere. The mole came from the neglect for proper maintenance by the Douglas administration. Just as they did at Mary Charles, the hospital fell in. And the member for number two, the Honorable Marcel Alibert, while serving as Minister of Health, did nothing to advance health care. The Tabernacle Health Center became termite infested, full of mold, a threat to health of the people, had to be closed down under their watch. And the pigeonhole 
the health center, in the basement of the daycare center in Tabernacle. Don't talk about St. Paul's police station. Same pattern of behavior. So we are not surprised that 1.5 million to keep the employees at government headquarters in a comfortable environment seems too much. So the staff in the office of the Attorney General must not have comfortable environment. The administrative staff of the Ministry of Labor, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Office of the Prime Minister, including the Archives and the GIS and the Ministry of Agriculture and the Personal Department must not have. No repairs, no renovation, no painting. And, pa ah. <laughs> and the Parliament. And we could well appreciate that Parliament needs a new home. And the Speaker needs his own offices. And the clerk has needs too. And we will <coughs> fix these. These are problems that we inherited. So all of these service providers of governmental and parliamentary service are here, but don't spend anything on them. Not at all, or else it is a big scandal. Spend the money to buy a lift up at Government House for Sir Edmund. Spend the money there. In 2013 and 2014, he spent nearly $4 million of taxpayers' money to renovate Government House, to persuade Edmund Lawrence to quickly read the boundaries report. Four million dollars. How low will you get? And up there, not finished. And then they come. <laughs> Member for number two, with this untruth. And I don't know why she continues to say that. The Attorney General and the member for number seven went up to government headquarters. House. House, sorry. And we fired Sir Edmund. I can't fire Sir Edmund. Her Majesty the Queen fired Edmund. Fired him. And when there were to be the cocktail up there, she sent the letter. Her Majesty the Queen was gracious in presenting me with a copy of the letter of termination to Sir Edmund. And the Honorable Attorney General and I went to say to Sir Edmund, are you aware that Her Majesty has terminated you? What is that? Because we received the letter maybe about five days after Her Majesty had terminated him. It meant that every act done by Sir Edmund after the date of the letter of termination was invalid, void, of no effect. And we could not allow our government operations to be paralyzed by a man who had been disappointed by Her Majesty the Queen. And when we went to Sir Edmund, Sir Edmund called the Lana back. I don't know if Delana higher than Her Majesty, because Her Majesty done do her work. Delana spent all night up there with Sir Edmund, wrote a letter, said he's sending it by emergency mail to Her Majesty. When Her Majesty is asleep, you can't wake up. <laughs> Over time, at the night time, Her Majesty must be in her bed. And the land about made a puppy of Sir Edmund that he's sending an emergency letter to Her Majesty. <coughs> and the Majesty already sent Sir Edmund the letter. letter? Nearly five days ago. He hid the letter from the land. The land became embarrassed because the Queen wrote back in her time to remind him that he had to go and that she was sorry, but she expect that the government will give him his due. And that was a story. Why did the member for number two bring that up? 
Why did she want Sir Edmund, who was no longer the representative of the Queen, to be at the reception, participating, participating in a fraud on the public, purporting to be the Queen's representative when five days ago the Queen had fired him? And Sir Edmund, truth be told, must be ashamed of himself to allow the member for number two to be dragging his name in Parliament over such a matter of principle. Over a matter of principle, your time is ended. Move up. That is what it's about. It wasn't that we went there to fire him. When we went there, he had already been fired. And so that again is part of the deception. Quickly, the member for number six, who wants to come back, said to us that the deflation is negative. That is a bad reflection on the economy. Consumer price index, according to the Central Bank report, went low, decreased. For the member who was a former minister of finance for all but two years, in 20 years, does not understand that when cost of living goes down, more money in the pocket of the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. The member for number six does not understand. And he could have asked an economist like you highly go, what does that mean? Disposable income improves when prices go down. He said it is a bad thing. How did we come about this? Our inflation is largely driven by the international marketplace. Food prices go down, we benefit from it. <coughs> Oil prices go down, we benefit from it. Manufacturing products prices go down, we benefit from it. It's an imported inflation and it reflects the stability in price movement in those economies from which we import. That is not a bad thing. That is a good thing for us when the prices are going downwards. I remember a time when price for a pound of salt was going for 20 plus dollars a pound. And every time I go to Value Mart, every time I go to Rams, I always go to check the price of saltfish. I like a saltfish breakfast. I go and I check the price to remind myself of one of the things that I had to deny myself. Because selfish price was too high then. I am happy to see it now. That is what that deflation is about. The opposition member without ethics comes to the house and instead of commend us for what was happening in tourism, he tried to attribute it to some work of Ricky Skerritt. Everyone knows Ricky is a talker, but not a deliverer. Everyone knows. That was one of the reasons advanced by the people of Antigua why he lost his job there. Ricky talks, but he never delivers. Tourism is taken off under the government. And then in an act of smartness and divisiveness, he said, you know, the tourism budget could have been a bit more. So I asked the financial secretary to give me the record of what he did when he was there for tourism. Would you believe that when we took over in 2014, over five years from 2010 to 2014, the tourism budget moved from 17.9 million to 18.65 million in five years? You call that no movement. Less than a million dollars he gave to tourism plant. In contrast, our tourism budget moved from 18.64 million in 2014 to over 30 million in this budget before the House. An increase of 65% between his tenure and ours still ongoing. He has no moral authority to speak. 
and he should not speak in particular about tourism. The second coup pay about which everybody is happy about and what it signals for the future growth of the country. Had we left that to the member for number six, we would not have a second coup spare because he wrote to the Triple C Corporation in Canada advising them not to have anything to do with St. Kitts. That is the man who wants to co come back to lead the country, Mr. Speaker. Second coup spare must not happen. For 20 years, he could not get the second coup spear out of the pipeline. And if we want to talk about corruption, then we must make available the email report from Carol Evelyn, who was the chairman of SCASPA when the discussions were taking place regarding the second coup spear. And the emergency meeting they tried to hold up at OTI to force that second coup spare on the back of the board. We will have to bring into the public debate the legal opinion given by the legal advisor to report then, a state scholar, saying that this deal was not ready for action. Already they had announced that the next day they were going to have a sign-in for the coup spear, but there were corruption involving it, and the legal advisor refrained herself from endorsing it. Carol Evening, a streamer, sent around an email to all members of the board indicating that he was unwilling to participate in the activity. That is why that did not happen. They couldn't recollect and get themselves together again regarding that. Symphony of the Sea came here, the largest cruise ship in the world, coming to the smallest country in the world. But nothing to praise the government about, even to commend us, even to commend the Minister of Tourism for such an outstanding achievement. No, 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 no. It's Ricky. <laughs> and when he want a little dance, he call him Grant to come, sing Grant up on him, man. <laughs> and he said, that is what we are dealing with. That is what we are dealing with, Mr. Speaker. They cannot be honest to the country. We hear, Mr. Speaker, them talk to us about their concern about sugar workers. That was already put to the voters and the loss. Accept it and move on. That you did not pay them $16 million. That our manifesto indicated that we will pay them $16 million. And within a year, Mr. Speaker, we paid them $16 million at not a cost to the public treasury, Mr. Speaker. That is the reality. We beat them on that matter before. We must beat them every time on it. When they closed the sugar industry, they paid 968 former sugar workers. When we paid out the Venezuelan gift of 16 million EC dollars, we paid and supported over 2,000 former sugar workers. And they are still grateful. 968 versus 2,000 plus. How you are going to win that conversation? What you are going to do to go back to them and say, give us back the money? You cannot win, you have lost. That argument. And so now they want to spoil that. As they want to spoil the CBI program from which Capitan Bass is a principal participant. Yes. 
they go and they said, well, we have something, you know, that says it was 16 million US. Who cares what you have when you are known to be the art of confusion and deception? It is the official records that matter, the official records of the government of Venezuela to which you must look to determine how much they gave to St. Kitts and Nevis. It is to the official records of the government of St. Kitts and Nevis to which you must look to determine how much was received. Funds for the government for the record cannot go into the account of any minister. Funds to the government has to go into the consolidated fund, the account of the accountant general. So it is to those entities that you must look to ask and to find out. What did the government of Venezuela said when we told them? What those unworthy persons and the opposition bench were saying about the $16 million? I read part of the communication, Mr. Speaker. Our government is disappointed to learn that our gift to the displaced sugar workers would be the basis of unfounded, I repeat, unfounded political allegations that now seek to tarnish the reputation of your government by questioning whether our government paid in US dollars or Eastern Caribbean currency. Both your team unity government and our government are fully aware that the currency of the grant was indeed Eastern Caribbean dollars. That's Venezuela. In a US check? That's Venezuela. That there are no suggestions to the contrary can only be interpreted as deliberately misleading and malicious. These untruths can never according to the government of Venezuela, can never be substantiated. Here is the payer saying in black and white how much they pay you. That is the authority. That is the authority. That is the evidence incontrovertible. Any other evidence to the contrary becomes hearsay. How that would hold up. If Nigel Carty Sorry, if a member opposite creates something, put it up on a website, who cares? Photoshop. What we need is this. Truth be told, truth be told, through this letter, our government also wishes to confirm that although there was a St. Kitts Nevis National Bank check used in the official representation, the grant settlement was never done by way of the said trick. Oh, right. This is it. So to clarify, they had a mock, if you will, presentation, just as when you have the carnival prize, and the man who wouldn't finish the song wins. You have a big cardboard, big so as a trick. Come take it. <laughs> but the real thing is what happens thereafter, what they pay this government was paid by transfer. The member for number one got the document yesterday, read into the record what it was. You, Mr. Speaker, have a copy of that. That is what you call in the court of law and the court of public opinion evidence. That is what? Yes. A ridiculous story, which they must know. They must know can easily be debunked and rebuffed for what it is worth, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, that is what the sender of the money said in clear language. What does the receiver said? Last time they came with that, I was going to say rubbish, but that falsehood would be more parliamentary and elegant. We got a report from the Accountant General Office, who is the only, only repository for funds for the government. Government funds have to go to the Accountant General as a matter of law. And we had then the report from the Deputy Accountant General, 
the wife of the former candidate, who again said that they were being malicious and misleading. So I asked the accountant general, who was accountant general that we inherited, yes. to give us the update on what has happened. Monday, the 7th of October 2018, Mr. Levi Bratcher, Accountant General, wrote receipts of funds from PDV Senkits, Nevis Limited, to pay former sugar workers. I hereby confirm the receipt by credit advice, not by check. The check was just something they had a little show there of goodwill. That is what it was. I hereby confirm the receipt by credit advice, the sum of 16 million Eastern Caribbean currency from PDV SKN Limited on behalf of the government of Venezuela for payment to former sugar workers. The funds were brought to account in the government's intelligent treasury management system and deposited to the account number, and he lists that. Dash 05, Sugar Workers Restoration Fund. Please find attached a copy of the credit advice and the cash receipt posting. Understand what is happening? The legitimate authority that is paying and receiving, giving corroborating stories, mystery, That's propaganda that they have. And he has provided the cash receipt posting and the appropriate check, the appropriate receipts that are there, Mr. Speaker. So those who want another chance are not interested in the truth. The evidence is here, unrefutable. If they are saying that the accountant general does know what he's doing, they must say so clearly. If they are saying that Mrs. Phillip, as the Deputy Accountant General, the wife of the former candidate for number four, is incompetent, say so bravely, yes. but don't, in the face of evidence, hard evidence, continue to mislead the country. That is what this is about. Readiness to lead. Readiness to move forward. And I say I have every confidence for the record in the Accountant General, the Deputy Accountant General, and the professional staff of the country. Mr. Speaker, we had this song and dance about law and order in the country, Mr. Speaker, and we have dealt with that in pasting in relation to certain personalities we have said bravely that the program of persons drying down on their leave will continue, and there's no apology for that. There's no need. It is the right thing to do in relation to that. I want to thank all of my colleagues, Head, who, when the country was going through a real difficult time in terms of homicides, out of what, with anything we could have foreseen, they determined that they would lend a helping hand. In the same way, we lent a helping hand to the Commonwealth of Dominica after the hurricane, when we sent our officers there to help restore law and order. When we asked, they responded. Indeed, just the other day, there was a flare-up of lawlessness in Dominica, and we said to them, we will ask that those who are here for you go back home to help restore law and order in Dominica because that is fundamental to the growth and prosperity of Dominica. So we are conscious of it. That is why the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda rebuffed the member for number six when he told him not to send Today for me, tomorrow for you. St. Lucia just had a recent upsurge in criminal activity. Said to us, things are out of control here. When you listen to them, you think it's something that Team Unity did. It is something that we inherited 20 years 
the highest homicide rate in the country was under the watch of the Douglas administration, 35. And we thank God, never has it reached that height. The question though, is it too high? Yes, it is too high. We want it to be down to zero, as close to that as possible, because the loss of one life is one life to many. That is the approach we have taken. That is the approach that will serve the country well. So the Arises came in to our support. And my grandmother would tell me not go. The country has had a peace dividend. Yeah. The police record would show that in relation to crime, in October, a significant reduction. In November, a significant reduction. And for December so far, a significant reduction. And all of us feel it and can attest to it. They have managed to hold the homicide steady, thanks be God, since they have come not one more. Understand what they have done? They can't go on Freedom Radio anymore to rejoice. So they have lost a point, which they never should have had. But they can't help themselves. Their agenda for regaining power is not to bring an enlightened view to the citizens and residents of the country. It's not to speak to better values of industry and service and loyalty to St. Kitts and Nevis to take it to the next plateau of development and growth. This, to as it were, call down the country on every occasion. This is to get Erasmus up every day, put out a negative story of the country. This is to get Erasmus did what he was doing in the BVI, get some news blogger in some place somewhere, pay them $25, to put up a bad story about St. Kitts and Nevis and then bring it back and play it on Freedom Radio. That is a recipe for disaster. They are unpatriotic. And that is why they cannot bring a solution. They said that they want to be a part. We held a forum, invited all. We said we didn't want it to be a talk shop. We said we want everybody to say what they will do to bring an end to crime and criminality, at least contained and reduced. What did they use the forum for? The member for number two went to the forum to talk about somebody had put something in her car. Mr. Chairman, I come to talk about my car, not about the country. Not about the country in a public forum at Marriott to which they were invited. She came to talk about her car. And when Commissioner Queeley spoke and issued a release, it was that Marcella's mechanic had put the very instrument about which she was complaining in her car. Marcella went to the forum to mislead the stakeholders into believing that the team unity government had put something in her car, a spy wheel. Who will have time to spy on Marcella in times like these? That is what the member for number two went to a national forum to discuss what help and support you can bring. She made it a conversation about her. What did the member for number six use the forum to do? He made it about him, made it about him. And he was talking about this imaginary character that is on Facebook. And this imaginary character, Mr. Chairman, has threatened me. I mean, what, what is it that a leader goes to a forum to talk about when we are discussing national issues, they personalize it. And on all occasions, their contribution amounts to nothing. That is why we had four consultations. And she said she wasn't aware. She was too busy doing other things, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, I want to congratulate all the law enforcement officers. I want to thank His Excellency the Governor General for investing policing powers in the members of the Defence Force, strengthening our crime response system. I want to thank all those members who agreed to become part of the National Strategic Framework Committee headed by Astafan to look comprehensively at the framework for national security across the various security agencies. Mr. Speaker, I say thanks to the NGO community and the private sector for their support, Mr. Speaker, for the efforts of law enforcement in St. Kitts and Nevis at this time. And I want to congratulate all who passed out today as course number 42, and to thank the senior minister, he is now back with us for representing the government at that particular passing out parade, as I had to be here to wrap up this debate. I want to say to the new High Command of the Police, Acting Commissioner Brandy, ACP MacArthur Brown, ACP Adi Adolf Adams, ACP Mitchell, that I am very happy with your performance to date. Continue to deliver the peace dividend that has been promised to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. You will have, as every high command must have, the fullest support of the federal government and of the Nevis Island administration. I want to say to have courage. Be not afraid. The criticisms will come by those who want to undermine law and order in the country. But you know the law. And you are trained to deal with these particular issues from time to time. I want to appeal to all of our citizens and residents to cooperate with the police. Do not break the law and then complain when the law enforcement officers take action. Remember, consequences are attributed to action. You cannot refuse to renew your firearm license, then blame others when you are caught in violation of the law. You cannot drive without a valid insurance or driver's license and then claim victimization when your abuse of the law and violation of the law get you before the court. Honesty and integrity is, are required of those charged with upholding the law. Mr. Speaker, the final matter I wish to address is the matter of the Public Accounts Committee. We have heard a lot about this, a lot of sound and fury amounting to nothing. And that has been the sum total of the contribution of the leader of the opposition. He made a fuss when the bill was coming into being about the fact that he must automatically be named chairman of the Public Accounts Committee. You gave him that privilege. And since 2017, the leader of the opposition as chairman of the Public Accounts Committee has been a dismal failure as chairman of the Public Accounts Committee. Mr. Speaker, one of the thing, things that he is required to do is to report to the National Assembly in accordance with Section 70, Subsection 6 of the Standing Orders, and prepare a report and the performance of its duties in respect of the financial year to be laid in the National Assembly. For 2017, the leader of the opposition did nothing. For 2018, the leader of the opposition did nothing. And then he comes to the parliament as if to hide his own incompetence, his own inaction, 
and try to blame somebody. Never once did he even start to write a letter to invite the other four members of the committee, the committee to come to a meeting. Did nothing but grandstand on the passage of the bill and grandstand now the bill is in operation. No interest in public accounts. No interest in public accountability. Mr. Speaker, he came and he said, you know why I didn't do anything? And imagine, you know, this was the man who, when he was Prime Minister, had some hard punches to go at the Minister of Foreign Affairs. He said the Minister of Foreign Affairs, then leader of the opposition, yes. was a failure. Yes. You are the chairman, you ain't do nothing. And you come here, you want me to do your work, I'm not going to do your work for you. You must do your work. Not going to live a helping hand. Look at him today. A pitiable sight. Look what he has come to now. Two years and he has done nothing. And the lame excuse, he said, well, you know, I want to question some people in government. And the legislation does not allow me. But who are the person, Mr. Leader of the Opposition, you would want to question? Because the lie is clear, properly clear too. This law conforms with the 20, 2007 Financial Administration Act. The Act there, which correlates to this, says the accounting officers answer for the performance of the ministry in terms of the financial um, arrangements. And so Section 8 of the Act provides power to summon witnesses. The committee may summon the financial secretary, that is the highest functionary with respect to the financial management. So you gave him access to the apex of the system. The leader of the opposition said, no, no, no. I am giving you the person with so much power and so much knowledge, that's not good enough. But who does he want to summon? Is it the cleaner? Is it the messenger? What will they tell you? What will you hold them accountable for? For not dropping off a mail? The law gives you the power to go to the highest level in the system. And to make up for his inadequacy, he complains. Financial secretary, in the end, has the obligation to report for the government as a whole, the permanent secretary. He can call any permanent secretary as a chief accounting officer of a department of government or even the accountant general himself. So if he really wanted to know whether it was 16 million ECRUS, call the accountant general. The accountant general would have brought the very evidence he has provided to me to you, and you would not have been out there saying those untruths, but he doesn't want that. So I'm not clear what is his concern, because the power to summon witness gives him full powers of access to all the principal officers. Permanent secretary, in the end, is responsible for his or her ministry and department. If you need anything answered, he or she will get it from the appropriate channel and comes. Then he says, what if he wanted to ask a question about expenditure? Well, who else to ask but the financial secretary who has all the records and the accountant general? It doesn't matter what the expenditure is. If it is on books, or library, the financial secretary must know and must answer. So these really are excuses. When you look at the accounts of TDC and Horsford, who you are going to ask about them? The financial controller or the CEO, that is what we gave you here. 
What is the difference? You go to the atrium. What do you rely upon? The financial accounts. Thursday, the National Bank sink its Nevis and Anguilla National Bank holds another atrium and will report that it has had the second highest profit reported. Second highest in all of his years outside that extraordinary year with the sale of the Visa card. In 2008, we have come a long way. The largest bank managed by local people with a competent board of directors that has seen it to the position where over $50 million in profits are being reported. Net profits, gross profits of over $80 million. Fifty million net. That is success. Yeah. How much we paying out on Thursday? Ten percent. Thirteen point five million dollars in dividends for all those who have shares in National Bank. That is what we are talking about. The country is moving ahead. Everyone is looking forward. The leader of the opposition comes to Parliament today to tell us to look back as his checkered pass. And I say enough is enough of that pass. Let us look forward to a brighter future. A future in which we know will be good and very special with the continuing of a team <coughs> unity government. I want to say thanks to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis for their vote of confidence on February 16, 2015. And I pledge that as a team, we will work together to advance not personal causes and agendas, but we will work to advance the good governance, the prosperity of St. Kitts and Nevis. And that score of good governance, I think it is very clear that those over there are in the darkness in terms of good governance and democracy. And every matter important to democratic life and good governance, we have advanced. The Public Accounts Committee you heard from the Premier of Nevis, never worked when he was leader of the opposition. No guidance. We brought a law to strengthen the hand of the Public Accounts Committee. We were so generous, we allowed the leader of the opposition to preside over that committee. And for two years, he never even managed to write a letter to convene a first meeting to present himself as the chairman. How do you fault us for that? They had the integrity in public life, legislation, languishing, afraid to touch it. Too many things were happening. We came in and we gave it life. We operationalized it. We put a committee together. They have a representative on that committee. We have done what they were afraid to do, and the good governance agenda. And we have put in the budget a significant sum of over a quarter million dollars to support the work of the integrity in public life, because we have nothing to hide. We have nothing to hide. It is not we who can't get a visit to go to the United States of America is the member for number six. He has something to hide. Even when he went on a plea of clemency, nobody wanted to see him or to talk to him about that. We want to continue doing what we are doing. We have said that we will reform the electoral system, and we are doing it administratively. 
We have put good, competent, professional persons in place. Legislatively, we are making changes. And in the new year, more things will come. There are some persons for their own selfish agenda who want to pick and choose which bill you must bring and what type. That is not how government works. Nobody elected them to determine the agenda of the government. They elected us. And at the end of the day, they will make a judgment on our performance. Give us the opportunity to do the good work on behalf of the people. The Premier of Nevis was so right. It is not 20 years we have had a decrease. It is just over three years. And look at our record to that of what was before us. Our record in fiscal management and discipline. A record of surplus after surplus, year after year, compared to deficit after deficit after deficit until you get bored ad infinitum, until in 2008 and 2009, when Timothy Harris assumed the office of Minister of Finance, I heard the AG recorded for the first time the country saw surplus, and as soon as they took back the Ministry of Finance in 2010, he went back in the gutter to the visit. Why would we want to go back to that sad state of affairs? Why would we want to go back to a time when for the first time in the history, the country was bankrupt, could not pay its civil servants, had to go to the IMF for begging for a quarter billion dollars of support to pay civil servants? and continue operations for the rest of the year. We have seen what that homegrown program meant. Three years, no increment. Moratorium, here cut on the church, here cut on the bank, here cut on national bank, here cut on social security, here cut on the holders of government security. Why do we wish to imperil our future by going back to the dark period yeah. in our history? The country is moving ahead, and the team we have here is very willing and very able. And at the appropriate time, certainly not in January and February, as some are thinking, we will go back to the people. And we have time on our hands for the record. The Attorney General tells me, Prime Minister, you have as much time as you will wish because you have until August 2020 to determine when and if you shall ring the bell. And I ain't start to think about the bell yet. I am thinking about all those wonderful things that are happening. I am thinking about getting the roads completed in number four. I am thinking about delivering the brand new health center in St. Peter's. I am thinking about the grand opening of the Tabernacle Health Center. I am thinking about new and improved services at the Draine France Hospital. I am thinking about the official opening of the second coup pair. I am thinking about the East Bastia condominiums. Oh, what a day it will be. 60 families we will put in brand new housings yeah. right there in East Bastia. Yeah, yeah. Those are the things that are now weighing on my mind. Not general elections. So long as we have the confidence of the people. And polls after polls continue to confound the wretched opposition. Really? That we are in good standing with the people. The country knows. The country has chosen. And the country is committed to a team unity government. May it please you, Mr. Speaker. I thank you.